Hello, everybody. So a couple of months ago, when I was uh, trying to figure out what to present at uh, .go, I figured that I will talk about various little quirks of the language that we at Ethereum we kind of grew to enjoy and grew to like. But uh, basically, mutability was one of them. And um, over the last three weeks, we had constant attacks on our blockchain. So I kind of reprioritized. And I kind of realized that immut immutability is kind of more important than the remaining of the quirks. So I will actually focus on immutability only. Before actually diving in, it's important to know that um, basically the context of, uh, of my talk and the context of uh, where I'm coming from. Um, I'm not sure how many of you heard about blockchains before, but uh, probably some, most of you heard about it. I'm sure most of you have not actually dived deep enough into know all the little quirks. But for example, if you look at blockchains from the outside, it's kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer network. So um, from the outside, it's, kind of, it, it's owned and operated by average people. It, it would seem that it's kind of similar as to as BitTorrent or Skype or whatever. And if you look at the two, uh, two images that I linked below, the leftmost is the Bitcoin network, the rightmost is the Ethereum network. It kind of looks like any distributed network. So what's so special about it? Well, first up, uh, even though every peer-to-peer -peer network is operated by, uh, by the community, by average people, uh, blockchain networks usually are owned by, the, owned by the people. What does this mean? Basically, if I were to provide as a developer of a blockchain, I, I create a new version of my client and I just release it, then if people don't update, then I cannot change the protocol, I cannot change the rules. So we as developers are completely at the mercy of users to update or not update. Now, um, the other interesting aspect is that uh, blockchains are always built up of open source clients. This means two things. First, it's good for security because good people get to find the bugs earlier. And it's also bad for security because bad people get to find the bugs earlier. <laughs> so uh, it's a kind of a double-edged sword. But the interesting thing compared to general peer-to-peer -peer networks is that your average peer-to-peer -peer network is used as a content distribution network, either uh, real-time as Skype or uh, non-real-time, for example, as BitTorrent. But the idea is that they, you transfer data. You get data from A to B. Whereas with blockchains, you don't transfer data. You actually try to do a consensus protocol. You try to agree on something. Philosophically, blockchains try to create an uncorruptible shared truth. That's what they want to agree upon. Less, more pedantically, or more practically, sorry, uh, blockchains are essentially distributed databases. So what they can do is you can, anybody in the world can try to update this database. So how does this work from a lower level point of view? Well, Initially, let's suppose that the entire network agreed upon a state, that this is the current state of the database, of this distri distri distributed database. Then everybody in the network tries to shove in various update requests into the database, trying to modify some state. And then after a while, be that seconds, be that minutes, somebody from the network stands out and says, OK, I just aggregated all of these changes. This is the latest thing that the database should look like and propagates these changes in the form of a block, hence where the blockchain comes from. And then everybody accepts these changes and updates their own local view of the database. So this is the essence of the blockchains. Now, of course, there can be, you might ask that since it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, um, why is that single guy more special? Why does he get to... Uh, aggregate all these transactions, not somebody else. Well, the truth is that the network protocol tries to make sure that this aggregation happens on a time-based, not a person-based. So every 10 minutes, every 15 seconds, somebody should be able to aggregate, but not sooner, not later. And as, although the protocol tries to avoid having multiple people aggregate at the same time, it can actually happen, which can mean that the blockchain might uh, experience a tiny fork. And uh, because of this, the database, if we uh, stick to the, our analogy, is only eventually consistent. OK, so this was blockchains close up. This uh, kind of seems like an amazing technology. So let's look a bit closer. Well, it turns out that blockchains are kind of the most toxic ecosystems in technology. What does this mean? The blockchains are uh, incentivized monetarily. So every blockchain has its virtual currency assigned to it. And whenever somebody helps the blockchain, it gets rewarded by virtual currency. 
This, although nice, it creates a market for this virtual currency. It may be worth little, it may be worth a lot, but still there is a market. And if there's a market, then you can speculate on the price. If you can speculate on the price, then vulnerabilities all of a sudden become much more interesting because if you find a vulnerability, do you report it or do you short the market? It's not, uh, not obvious many, most of the times. For example, just, a, just to mention the two biggest uh, problems in Bitcoin world and Ethereum world, the first Bitcoin Mount Gox, where they lost some uh, 400 and something million dollars in one theft, and Ethereum world, that was about $64 million in about 10 minutes. And we watched that go. So it's, um, it's not always obvious that people will do the right thing, uh, given the enough, enough incentives. So what does this have to do with .co? Well, first up, Ethereum. There are two, currently two major blockchains which really stand out. One of them is Bitcoin, you probably heard of it. The other is Ethereum. Ethereum is kind of a souped up version of uh, Bitcoin that not only allows you to transfer value, but you can also run smart contracts, programs. It's a really, really fancy thing, but we don't, won't go into it. What's interesting about it is that the, ma the majority client is actually written in Go. So that's nice. So where does dot .go come into the picture? Well, uh, about three weeks ago, we had our yearly de developer conference. It started on the 19th of September at 9 o'clock in the morning. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, 70% of our network dropped offline all at the same time. Well, it turned out that uh, somebody found a bug in our caching mechanisms, and they decided to crash the entire network right before our conference. So that's, uh, that's not a good way to wake up in the morning when you know that you have to do a presentation. So we did actually manage to fix it up fairly quickly, but uh, we're, for the last three weeks, we're kind of constantly battling these, uh, these attacks. And uh, what happened? What was the issue? Well, the issue is that the Ethereum's state, the state of the network, or we could say the state of the database, is a giant tree data structure. It's currently composed of 2.8 million nodes, unique nodes, where if we were to count duplicates, it's an order of magnitude higher. And uh, the problem is that when you have this huge database that kind of changes every 15 seconds, every 15 seconds a new block arrives, which overrides part of the state, it actually can override previous parts of the state, it gets really, really messy. And if your data structure is mutable, then it's really hard to keep track of everything. So people kind of tend to do the easy thing and just copy data, which kind of tends to lead to out-of-memory attacks. So what was the problem? Well, Go world, the classical way of sharing data is via communication. We have the famous uh, motto that don't uh, communicate via sharing memory, share memory via communicating. This is nice, but it has a few drawbacks. One of them is that uh, if, uh, if I want to share a lot of data, then it takes time. If I have to send in a lot of data via channels, obviously it has a performance impact. The other problem is that uh, if uh, I want multiple GoRoutines to access the same large amounts of data, then actually it requires quite, quite a lot of copies, quite a lot of duplicated data. It's fine if my data is one megabyte, it's less fine if my data is 20 gigabytes. And last but not least, um, whenever I'm mutating data, whether that's a globally mutated data protected by a lock or a locally mutated data via channels, the problem is that I lose the previous value. So I don't know if I have to operate simultaneously on the current value and on the previous values, possible values too, then all of a sudden it becomes really, really complicated to reason about this. And this is where mutability and channels don't perfectly match the requirements. So a different approach actually to the problem is to share via immutability. Now, how does that work? Well, if you go back to the basics, really the basics of Go, Probably the first two things that uh, anybody working with Go learned is what a string is and what a byte slice is and what are the differences between the two. And on the surface, they kind of look the same thing. So a string is just a pointer plus a length uh, field, which point to the a fixed data structure. And it's really nice, so the length field is only needed because you can then slice and dice up your big string into smaller, tiny strings, and they will reuse the same memory location with the half of the length. So Strings are straightforward. Byte slices, well, they are straightforward too. The only difference is that they kind of have a plus one field, a capacity, 
And what this capacity field allows is it allows mutations to the slice. So whenever I want to append stuff to the slice, if the appending uh, data would actually exceed the capacity of the original slice, no problem, we'll just create a new slice and everything goes on as if nothing had happened. And on the surface, they kind of look like the same. Internally, there's a huge difference that I'm quite sure everybody's aware of, but I'm not sure everybody appreciates it. The difference is that while slices are mutable, strings are immutable. And it's important to emphasize that strings are the only immutable things in Go. And furthermore, if you search for the keyword immutability in the Go ref spec, you will find a single reference to it, a single occurrence. So Go doesn't really do immutability. However, immutability has some huge advantages. For example, uh, strings are most importantly safe to share between Go routines. So I personally, I don't know about you, but I personally, when I started learning Go, I learned strings, I learned Go routines, I just passed around strings all over the place, and everything was working perfectly, and then I realized that, whoa, these are these byte slices, and they are much better than strings, they are much fle more flexible, I can modify, I can expand, and I just replaced all my strings with byte slices. And my entire program came crashing down because, obviously, byte slices became mutable, and I overwritten byte slices all over, all over the place in many Go routines. So people kind of learn that, okay, strings are mutable, immutable, you can pass them around, by slices are not, are not immutable, so you need to create copies. However, two things that people don't really realize uh, or actually don't think about it so much is that uh, if I slice and dice up a string, then I can actually reference the same memory location. So even though it is immutable, it's thread safe, I can pass it all over the place, I pass the same data, I don't need to duplicate data. And the other thing is that strings are kind of lightweight objects. So I can copy them all over the place and they will have minimal impact. Since I'm not copying the data itself, I'm just copying the references. So let's try to copy this. If it, strings are so awesome versus, blights, versus uh, byte slices, they are so nice in concurrency, can we do immutability ourselves? The answer is yes, we can do user space immutability. But obviously we cannot make existing types immutable because Go doesn't have the concept of immutability. So what we'll do, simply create our own custom structure that we will, via our own pain and effort, ensure that it remains immutable. How do we do that? Well, simple. We make all, private, all the fields, member fields private. Obviously, if it's something public, then it's modifiable. We don't want that. We need to make all members, we need, we need to initialize all members upon construction, just to make sure that they, everything is initialized because we're not allowed to modify afterwards. And of course, we may have constructors, but we are not allowed to have any mutators inside our data structure. And this kind of seems obvious. The two things that may not seem obvious from the first uh, sight is that uh, if, I'm, if I'm doing immutable types, then I need to retain this data purity meaning that if I'm actually passing in anything that's kind of even remotely mutable into my immutable object during construction, I need to actually copy it to make sure that it remains uh, immutable. And vice versa, when I'm getting something out from the immutable object, I need to make sure nobody from the outside gets to modify it. So if we were to look at this uh, in a code-wise, to create an immutable gopher, we can just make sure that all fields are private, I have a name, I have a picture, both of them private, when I write my constructor, the name field I can simply assign, since that's immutable, that's fine. But if I want to assign the picture, since that's a byte slice which is mutable, I need to actually create a deep copy. And as I previously said, we're not allowed to have getters, but sorry, we're not allowed to have setters, but if we have getters, that's completely fine, as long as we actually make a copy out of them when we retrieve. Okay. This is really nice, immutable, we can pass it to any arbitrary Go routine, it will be thread safe, but it's kind of boring. So, yeah, whatever. Interesting things happen when you start composing objects. So, the nice thing about immutability is that if you compose arbitrarily many objects one into the other, then the result will still be immutable. So, we'll have all the properties, all the... Uh, you can share it, you can do whatever with it. And why is this good? Well, for example, it allows really intertwined memory sharing. So if multiple data structures, I have 100 data structures that share part of the same common data, then I can have that only once inside. I can have that in memory only once, and I don't need to copy it 100 times. And that's really, really powerful from a memory perspective. And uh, an important thing to note, that if I have an immutable structure, similar to strings, it, they must be really, really light, because they will get copied all over the place. 
because, for example, when I assign, uh, I, when I construct uh, an immutable data structure, I actually do need to assign my, uh, to my fields, and that will be a copy in Go world. And because of this, uh, as long as I can keep my uh, immutable data structures light, everything should be fine. Looking at, uh, at the same example with uh, gopher composition, <laughs> if I want to create a gopher family, I can simply add a new field to my, uh, my data structure. Let's say those are immutable. Although the gophers are immutable, pointers to gophers are mutable already. So in my constructor, constructor I actually do need to create a copy of all my gophers. But as I said, since they are immutable and since the gophers themselves are shallow objects, copying them is really, really cheap. It doesn't copy the pictures, it doesn't copy anything, it just copies a few pointers and a few numbers. So that one is really cheap, yet it ensures immutability. Furthermore, of course, if I have a getter that wants to retrieve an internal pointer, I cannot just return that pointer because somebody might actually replace the data underneath it, so I do need to create another copy. But all of them are cheap. And what are the benefits? Well, if you look at the gopher, the squishable gopher descendancy graph, then um, the pink gopher has the same ancestors as the uh, purple gopher, but it is w enough to store them only once in memory. And that is really powerful. And even though I, c I, can, I can send these gopher hierarchies all over the place, storing them once is enough. Now, of course, uh, immutable hierarchies are nice, but mutations are even nicer. And the only way to mutate immutable data structures is actually to create new data structures out of them. So what we can do is if we want to mutate something deep inside, we just split open our data structure, we just mutate internally, and then, of course, since it's immutable, we actually have to create a new hierarchy from that point onward, recombining the existing nodes with the uh, mutated nodes. And, uh, of course, um, whenever we mutate immutable data structures or create new data structures instead, these have a cost hit on the garbage collector since we are doing new objects, creating new objects. And how would this look in code? Uh, well, I have a better idea. How would this look graphically? So let's say I have my original uh, gopher hierarchy of the squishable gophers and I figure out that, hey, I just realized that uh, the original brown gopher has two descendants, the radio stations logo and, uh, and the bunny. So what I can do is I can just add it, st start extending the purple gopher, I go up straight to the brown gopher, I attach my new gophers to the brown gopher, and then I actually have to create new gophers from that point downward. And even though I did create new data structures, since these are really, really light, li lightweight, and they do share the same data underneath, it's completely fine because the majority of the data will be shared. And this is the important thing. If you think about it, this is exactly, for example, how blockchains work and how Ethereum works, namely that I can take my old state, I can modify it to get into a new state, and voila, I, I just shared all of my memory. And just to sum it up, uh, data structure mutability is really nice because I can have concurrent access, I can share the same memory via composition, and, um, and I can easily reason about complexity. Whereas data structure mutability is kind of hard because Go doesn't really support it and it does have a performance impact on the garbage collector. And if just to leave you with a single sentence that you should remember out of this talk, if whenever you're writing your own programs and you figure that, hey, I might want to copy this data structure, think about it, how much data that copy entails because you might actually hurt yourself really bad and take 70% of your network offline. And in those cases, Remember immutability as it might be a solution. Maybe not, maybe yes, but if it is, you got the solution up your sleeve. Thank you.